Hi. So if everyone could take their seats now, we're starting panel two. And if everyone could just migrate back. We're about to start panel two. Thank you everyone for your time and thank you for being here. Um, we're really excited to have everyone here, especially our four panelists for panel two. This panel is titled Political Economies of Chinese Socialism. We'll have Bikram Gill, Xu Zhen, Elias Khalil Jabor, and Chris Matahako speaking. First, I invite Bikram Gill to speak. Um, sorry, one second. Bikram Gill is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Virginia Tech, where he is also a core faculty in the aspect of doctoral program. His research interests are generally situated at the intersection of international political economy, political ecology, agrarian studies, and global history. Bikram, take it away. Thank you, thank you Michelle. Uh, thanks to all the organizers for inviting me here and for everybody uh, for being here as well. I'm gonna just kind of jump straight into it because um, I know time is, is somewhat limited and uh, there's a lot I'm hoping to cover. Um, so I'm gonna, I might not get to everything, so I'm just gonna kind of give an over, overview of what I wanna talk about at first, and then I'll try to get through each, each step along the way. Um, so I just wanted to begin, though, with uh, referring to a book that the People's Forum has just published uh, by John Ross, uh, China, A Great Road, because I just think um, it, it starts with the right set of questions, right? So often the left is debating, um, is China capitalist, is China socialist? Um, hegemonic, imperialist, south-south, what is the correct language and framework? And I think what's nice about John Ross's book is it starts with a very materialist set of questions, right? So what it, what it asks us to uh, engage with is the fact that um, over the past 40 years and even the past 70 years, that there's been an absolutely unprecedented world historical transformation um, in China. Now we can think about this in terms of the 800 million plus people lifted out of poverty, right? Over the past uh, 40 years, we can think about it in terms of the unprecedented increases in life expectancy, um, in health conditions, in in um, the the ending of hunger, you know, the accomplishment of China in ending hunger by the 1970s. Uh, in comparison, uh, which a lot of my work I'll compare India with China. It's it's striking, right? How 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 these two paths diverged, right? So the question. I think uh, that it, it provokes for us is uh, how do we make sense of how China actually has been quite singular uh, along its path in comparison to a lot of other global south countries, right? How do we, what, what framework and what language can help us understand um, China on its own terms as well, right? Now capitalism and socialism as, as Marxists is very important that we think in that tradition but we also should follow Samir Amin who is probably more Marxist than anybody who in one of his final essays said we, we have to also locate China in a very distinct history and maybe going back to the Taiping Rebellion and much earlier where uh, necessarily locating it as socialist or capitalist doesn't always hold, right? So um, I think, uh, so what, what, what language, what framework can help us make sense of, of this undertaking that has actually addressed the material questions that socialists are concerned with, right? It's, and it's addressed the legacy particularly of not capitalism, but capitalism uh, understood as an imperialist system, right? It's, it's overturned those legacies. And so what the point I'm gonna make, the argument I'm gonna make, is what China has done is it has violated a rule, right? So we hear Anthony Blinken all the time saying China's violating the rule of law. In fact, it is. It is violating the rule of law, but then the question is what is this rule of law? It's not, and one doesn't need to oppose it by saying, well, there is, there is a rule of law of imperialism, okay? So, but the rule of law of imperialism, to understand it, we can't go to Lenin, which is where people often go. We go to Samir Amin, and I, I go to Samir Amin, and I go particularly to one of the last essays he wrote before he passed, Contemporary Imperialism. Okay, to understand wh which rule is China violating, right? What, well, how is it overturning imperialism? What is imperialism? Okay, so for Lenin, imperialism is the highest stage. Right? Imperialism comes at a particular moment when a, a particular set of uh, contradictions requires the export of capital, right? Now, Samir Amin in this piece, and it's, it's not a novel point, it's a familiar point. His point is, look, imperialism has always been integral to capital from its origins. There's no, never been a capitalism without imperialism, right? It's not simply a secondary moment to overcome internal contradictions. It's there from its founding, right? Now, Samir Amin in his work 
then shifts from the law of value to the law of worldwide value. Okay, so what does he suggest, right? Is that the core periphery, global north, global south, constitutes a major contradiction of an imperial capitalist system. So as leftists, that something it should be a provocation to always remember that capital labor is not the only contradiction of an imperialist capitalist system, right? There's a second contradiction, okay? And I'm saying second contradiction deliberately. I am invoking the tradition of ecological Marxism. I won't get into it here, but they call the second contradiction the society nature contradiction, okay? But, and the, my work looks at this, and I can talk about this later, but the, a second, I, in my view, the society nature contradiction maps onto the core periphery um, contradiction, okay? So now the thing about, so Samir Amin, his work will look at how the system has been constituted through a drain of value from periphery to core, right? So what, what, uh, what I wanna begin by briefly talking about um, is, um, uh, and I probably took up half my time just with that, that introduction, but what I wanted to begin with is um, thinking about well, what, is, what is the second contradiction, right? And what is the, the, the rule that underpins it, right? And how has China overcome it, right? So to understand the second contradiction, to understand the role that the denial of sovereignty, right, the denial of sovereign capacity to peoples in the periphery has played in the formation of the capitalist system, right? First, we have to begin by recalling that capitalism doesn't emerge simply through enclosures that create a proletarian class, right? And a surplus that generates a category of capital only through the enclosure of a commons that generates, again, the proletariat, that there's, a sec there's a, another category of enclosure in the colonies. Okay, so this is happening in the colonization of the Americas in the 16th century uh, through to the 19th century, this historical period. This is an appropriation of, let's say, the, for lack of a better word, perhaps the national wealth, right, uh, that has historically been produced in the regions that become constituted as the peripheries, right? So let's think historically, the emergence of capitalism is also a project where Europe is seizing hold of the wealth of the Afro-Asian world system, right? In, or in the Americas, it's seizing hold of the accumulated social wealth of those societies, right? And what, what, what's, what's propelling Europe is it's at the margins of the world system for centuries beforehand, right? The Indian Ocean world system is a multipolar world system, right? It's a multipolar world system structured around a centralized kind of Chinese Federation, the worlds of Islam, right? Very different history than European history. So, you know, Eurocentric history is feudalism to capitalism, but that wasn't what was happening in the rest of the world, right? There was a different processes of wealth generation that that form of primitive accumulation, it's a seizure of the wealth of non-Western peoples, right? And part of that process of enclosure, if enclosure in Europe gives rise to capital labor in the colonies by seizing that national wealth, Right? It gives rise to a racialized distinction right? between who can be sovereign and who can't be sovereign. Right? And it, it pivots on this question of rationality, who can be rational and who can't be rational. Right? And this goes from the colonization of indigenous peoples in the Americas. Okay? If you look at the law, the founding of international law in the 16th century, it was founded on a racialized distinction right? between the Spaniards and indigenous people. And the indigenous people were denied the right of sovereignty because they were held to be irrational for denying Spanish the right to trade in their territories because trade was occupation and colonization. So that very resistance took away their sovereign right. Okay, so um, this, this, via, this, this denial of the right to trade to Western colonizers is then you, in doing so, you forsake your claim to sovereignty. So the only way to become legitimately sovereign is to... Uh, honor the right to trade of the Western colonizer, right? So that's, um, that's been an elemental rule of the system, right? If you look at now, if we look specifically at China, okay, in the 19th century, when did the opium wars uh, happen? When China bans, uh, starts putting regulations and cracking down on opium trading, right? And so they're forcibly, China's forcibly opened, right? It's forcibly subjected to this rule of capital imperial property, right? So now there's a quasi-sovereignty that China has, right? It's not fully sovereign. It's under the rule of Western property, right? And this has been the story of the periphery more generally. And that's what enables the drain of value from the periphery to the core, okay? So that's the, that's the reality that global south and colonized states confront, right? Is how to address the fact that in a capitalist world system, their primary contradiction is not capital labor, 
right? But a core periphery one that is built upon a racialized denial of sovereignty. And at, at one point I want to make this really important on this, is we often think about racial capitalism as being built on anti-blackness, right, and anti-indigenous racisms. Orientalism and anti-Chinese racism is also very fundamental to the emergence of capitalism as a world system. If we think about the language of oriental despot in the 19th century, right, we think about the way in which um, the subjugation of China in the 19th century and the appropriation of value was so integral, right, to capitalist formations. Um, and the language was that the Chinese sovereign is inherently despotic. It's an inherently irrational use of resources, right? That, and it becomes very incredibly racialized, right? So that's something to remember. Now, what is the, what was at the heart of the great decolonial anti-imperial movements of the 20th century? And we forget this, right? It was, the, it was the reclamation of sovereignty, but based upon transforming the underlying property relations that have been instituted by this imperial capitalist world system, right? But the problem is each time a movement of decolonization stood up, right, and claims formal independence and tries to transform these conditions, they're either sanctioned, right, and so they're, they're, if they violate the right of Western property in their territories, if they violate the right of Western capital, Right? then they're immediately denied full sovereign recognition. Those states that don't, right? those states that don't undertake projects of nationalization, those states which don't undertake projects of land reform, they're accorded sovereign recognition, but that's really just a quasi-sovereignty then. Right? So you can compare, uh, say, a state like Bolivia you know, to a state like Colombia. Right? You, can, you, can, you can look at the challenges that are uh, happening there. And so what I, what I would argue is that what China did what China really violated and why China is the primary target of imperialism today is that China from 1949 till today has overturned this rule of imperialism. Okay, so how does, how does China do this? It starts with land reform. Okay, so in, again, we follow Samir Amin by going to the Taiping Rebellion. Okay, and um, what, 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 the Taiping Rebellion is the kind of first shot launched in China against imperialism. Right? And what is the, what is the, what is, um, uh, during the Taiping Rebellion, there is a manifesto called the Land System of the Heavenly Dynasty. Okay, and, and it demands that all land under heaven will be cultivated in common by all who live under heaven. All land under heaven will circulate to equalize abundance and scarcity. Okay, so we have, un from the Taiping Rebellion, a response, okay, great, um, a response to um, the conditions that were uh, imposed under the kind of uh, denial of Chinese sovereignty post-Opium Wars, post-Treaty of Nanking. Right? So it's starting there, but in 1949, what was distinct about the Chinese Revolution is that it's built on the basis of the peasantry, right? of peasant power. Right? You think about the Long March, the Chinese Long March, how significant that was in the global decolonization movement. You know, so if we think about anti-blackness, anti-indigenous racism, we cannot skip over how central the Long March was to addressing the anti-Chinese orientalist foundations of the capitalist world system in the Chinese Communist Party, the Communist Party of China, excuse me, they learned during the Long March, right, that it's the peasantry that uh, experienced the contradictions of imperialism more than any other social group, right? It's only when they're expelled from the cities and they go into the countryside. And it gives rise to this two-way socialization where the party is socialized by the peasants and the peasants are socialized by the party, right? And it really centers the question of land reform as being at the heart of overcoming the property relation that underlies imperialism, right? So, how do you as one reclaim resource sovereignty on a collective basis that redistributes resources towards the aim of local national development? Right? That, and that was a major, major kind of outcome of the Long March. And it's worth noting, I'm just going to say this as a quick aside, for fans of Fran uh, for fans, sorry, that's a, it's weird to say fans of France Fanon, but uh, for fans of Fanon, Fanon was incredibly uh, influenced by the Chinese Long March. That's entirely missing from our understanding of you know, the greatest theorists of decolonization, you can't read his chapter on violence, you can't read his chapter on spontaneity without reading the Chinese Long March, right? And so uh, the Chinese Long March, it gives rise to the peasant way, the Yunnan way, right? This idea of uh, kind of land reform being the foundation, okay, of overcoming the legacy now of imperialism. So what is the legacy of imperialism? So this rule of draining value from periphery to core. Now decolonized states confront this problem. Right now, all capital has been drained to the core, right? So you know, you're, you're, you're independent, you're formally free, but you remain dependent on capital investment uh, from, from the core, right? In 1949 and after, China broke that, right? So they start this program of labor accumulation, not capital accumulation, 
where by, by doing uh, farming on a communal basis, it allows for the kind of mobi uh, the development, mobilization, and consolidation of productive forces through labor-intensive mobilization, right? And it leads to really important infrastructural development, and it gives China a stock of domestic capital, right, that other global cell states are not able to generate. And the, the case I look at most is India, and, uh, you know, I can talk about that later, but it's a very, very clear distinction than what happens in India. And so, you know, by the 1970s, uh, China also undertakes a program of nationalization, right? Uh, immediately nationalizing, uh, well, it takes a while, but they nationalize British firms especially um, in China. And, but what I want to maybe close by emphasizing is that in post-1979, China does not abdicate this path, okay? It's important to also remember that post-1979, China builds upon, although I know uh, your research may, 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 <laughs> might maybe disagree with that in some ways, but in important ways, China's engagement with the world market builds upon this foundation of access to common land, right? It builds upon what uh, Giovanni Arrighi and Gillian Hart have called accumulation without dispossession. That what is distinct about the Chinese path of development is it doesn't dispossess the peasantry, right? That it actually uh, grants the peasantry access to land. And it's the strength of China's labor force, Arrighi argues, that allows China to engage the world market post-1979 from a position of strength. Okay, so we have to keep in mind on the left, you can't romanticize China post-1979 pre either. Now, it's not to critique or uh, dismiss China pre-1979, but the kind of the path of land reform, the path of nationalization did much to end hunger, right? It did a significant amount to raise a domestic stock of capital, to build infrastructure, uh, but it hit limits in productive capacity, right? And the challenge that all third world states have faced from the Haitian Revolution onwards is that the moment of independence invites the moment of recolonization. And so it's an unavoidable question to build up the productive capacity of a society to build up the military capacity. That's not ideal, but that's the world we live in, right? So the question becomes, um, what does one do then, right? And so here there's a limit, there's an exhaustion of the productive capacity of the existing rural order. This is transformed into the household responsibility system. Um, this, is, is, this gives rise to township and village enterprises. China seeks to, and the, way, the word I like to use is appropriate back. Okay, because the capital markets on the world system were appropriated from the global south. So China engages intensively the world market post-1979, right, um, in order to appropriate back, you know, the capital that was drained the other way, right? And it, it's able to impose conditions on Toyota. It's able to impose conditions on other firms that other states aren't able to do because China has a labor force that has access to common land that's not totally dispossessed. And uh, Arigi's argument, Adam Smith in Beijing, is that Toyota actually wanted to go to China. Right? It wasn't China begging for Toyota to come. Toyota also wanted to go because chi China had a labor force um, that, was, so that was skilled, that had access to land, that could reduce costs, that wasn't available kind of anywhere else, right? So this opens up access to capital. It, opens up, um, it opened up for China access to technology. And the key question is how it was able to access technology from the world market in a non-dependent register, right? That's a really important lesson for global cell states to learn, right? Is how do you, how, how was China able to today, right? It restructured its state-owned enterprises, right? Along market lines, but still in a way that was oriented towards certain national objectives, right? Which is a difference between, say, a capitalist system outright, you know? And I think I would follow uh, Arigi and Amin in saying that post-1979 China might not be socialist, but we don't know if it's capitalist either. Right, there's many tendencies at play here uh, that by necessity, China had to engage the capitalist market. It had to open these processes up, but that doesn't mean the socialist road is closed so long as um, access to land is maintained uh, in the countryside, as Samir means um, point, right? But there is, so there's been, there's been you see the rise of Chinese uh, firms today. You see the rise of state-owned enterprises, right, that themselves own and develop the technologies. Right, that is something that, again, we haven't seen anywhere uh, in the Global South, which has given rise to certain risks, right? That two-way socialization between the peasantry and the party, it's been challenged now by socialization between the party uh, and the emerging bourgeois elements, right? But that doesn't mean that's a settled question. It doesn't mean that this is a, a question that has been uh, totally resolved, right? Um, I think there's, there's certain risks that are also at play in China's international relations. Okay, I think important question on the imperialism question when it comes to China is that China has an entirely different structural foundation than Western imperialist countries, right? We have to ask that question, what propels Western capital out 
into the global market and what propels China. Okay, entirely, entirely, the Western capital from its origins is based on a drain of value from periphery to core. It depends and it must renew that, right? China's accumulation path was built first on a labor intensive internal mode, right? And so it's launching into its relationships with other global cell states from a very different uh, structural point of departure, right? So I think that's quite important. But again, there's certain limits we're seeing too that one has to ask the question, right? So the importance of engaging the world market, right, is something global cell states can't defer. They have to break dependence. Well, with a, uh, a benefit we've seen of China mobilizing its surplus has been the paths that it's opened up for other global cell states, particularly African states, right? We've seen the way in which there's been mutually beneficial results in terms of infrastructural development, right? So that's, that's the one comment I wanted to make on um, China-Africa relations is that, uh, you know, those who comment and use the language of imperialism, it's quite funny, is that for 30 years before 2008, the condition of a lot of African states was one in which um, there was underinvestment for 30 years. The legacy of IMF and structural adjustment programs uh, was to deny any investment, right? And so the Chinese engagement, the China-Africa China relations have addressed this structural underinvestment um, in infrastructure and agriculture and other, other sectors. But you know, one, one can't turn away from thinking about if the highest priority always is, right? Engaging the world market, developing the productive forces, being strategic and tactical in a long run game vis-a-vis -vis Western capital, right? If this leads to decisions such as buying the Haifa port in Israel, right? if it leads to certain decisions with working with certain um, other states, right? I think those are, those are questions that, are, that must be asked as well, right? Is there, have there been a certain set of limitations uh, to that strategy as well? But I think um, at, a, at, a, at a more general state, the implications we're seeing with uh, China's uh, role in South-South relations has been, um, I think one, and one thing that's scaring imperialist countries is that for the first time in 200, maybe 500 years, right? The Belt and Road Initiative, China's relations with African states is changing the uh, route of surplus uh, production and appropriation, right? So we're seeing for the first time surplus not only ending up in London, not only ending up uh, in Wall Street or in offshore accounts, that we're seeing the distribution of that surplus um, outside of the circuits dominated by Western finance capital. Um, so I think, um, and so the, these lessons, I'll, I'll conclude just by saying like, it's the, the critiques of China are fundamentally like uh, confused that they don't understand that China is being attacked for its violation of the rule of imperialism, right? That the, the entire concern is about uh, how it overturned the underlying property relations of imperialism through land reform, uh, through nationalization, and how on a global scale now it is integral to disrupting the flow of value to the core, right? That's, uh, that's I think the beginning and in many ways, the end of the conversation vis-a-vis -vis the concerns of a lot of the Western left uh, with China. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll stop there, but thank you for. Thank you so much. And um, Bikram also has, is working on an article, Comparative Between India and China's Models, which is also going to be fire. So look out for that. Um, our next speaker is Xu Jun, um, who teaches economics at John Jay College. His recent book, From Commune to Capitalism, How China's Peasants Lost Collective Farming and Gained Urban Poverty, was published by Monthly Review Press. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, and um, really appreciate for the opportunity to speak here, to participate. Um, um, I, I believe for many of you, including myself, um, since pandemic, it's very depressing in general. But um, I think the, uh, the uh, seeing the emergence of child collective is definitely, you know, uh, brightens the day um, for me and for many. Uh, so. Uh, really appreciate all the work, important work, great work that Child Collective and also People's Forum have been doing all of the years. Um, I grew up in China. I now work in the United in New York for, just for the moment, and um, um, and I agree with most of the views uh, that um, are were um, uh, shared by the speakers uh, before me. And um, but uh, as as someone who has been uh, a part of the um, 
um, uh, leftist uh, movement struggles in China, I would probably be more, a little bit more critical on the Chinese experience. Um, um, and today I want to talk about China as a challenge to capitalism. Um, if we look at the mainstream media uh, and some other media, and you see that uh, China is often perceived as an important player in world capitalism. Um, it, regardless of what Chinese government or China uh, portrays itself as, you know, its Chinese characteristics, uh, some certain kind of socialism, etc. But it's an important player. And indeed, um, the, I think the collaboration between the Chinese elites and the ruling classes uh, in the United States and the West in general have been some part of the founding blocks of the contemporary capitalist order, and we know that. Um, and some people like this and hope that um, the US and China would be wise enough so that they would can you know, preserve, preserve that relationship. You know, just don't disrupt. Um, and, and some other people don't like it. Um, they, um, you know, uh, they think that they, they don't like China's particular role in world capitalism. Um, there are many possible reasons. For example, some people think that capitalism deserves better, you know, something better. Um, and, and some other fear that uh, China is, is too dangerous, and too untamed um, for the purpose of developing capitalism. Um, and here, I, I think those views, um, either appraising or uh, more critical, they focus on China as a friend and sometimes even a savior of capitalism. Um, but I think there is, a, a, I think this is an important part uh, that uh, we can overlook uh, that China as a potential challenge to capitalism. Um, so how can we see China as a challenge to capitalism? It's because yes, all the trade, all the great investment that China is doing, the, it in itself is not necessarily against capitalism. It can be promoting um, uh, some important necessary industrialization, et cetera, but it's, it's not sufficient in my mind. Um, I think that uh, we, we should understand that China started its reintegration uh, to the world capitalism um, starting from the 19, late 1970s after Chairman Mao passed away. And, that, and we know that reintegration of the former Soviet Union and China, among others, uh, greatly extended the lifeline of capitalism. Um, but unlike in the Soviet Union, Chinese elites, um, they chose to develop market relationship, there's a certain type of capitalism in a more cautious way, a gradualist fashion, um, which enabled um, continuous and rapid capital accumulation and economic growth over the past four decades. Um, so this sustained accumulation brought huge amount of wealth um, to a new capitalist class. Um, and on the other hand, as I argued before, uh, you know, the, the rural workers, the peasants, the lost, the communes, the collectives, and the urban workers, millions of people, lost their lifetime employment and all the social benefits. Um, and the market forces have, in general, impoverished, like anywhere else, impoverished all the working people. Um, you know, it's people suffer from the rising cost of education, housing, and healthcare. It's despite all the efforts that fight extreme poverty and mm -hmm. others from the state. Um, and not to mention the corruption, uh, the mafia, um, you know, and all the environmental damages. Those are all true. Um, yet, I, I would like to argue that capitalism has not secured its rule in China. And China remains a big unfinished project for capitalism itself. Um, because of its, the reform was done in a gradual way, not in Russia, which is sort of like a one-time deal, um, Chinese states, the whole legitimacy um, is still based on Marxism and revolution and all the legacies that um, other speakers have, have talked about. So that creates a, a, a challenge to, to them. Um, well, let me uh, quote from an old Chinese classics. 
Confucius or Kongzi, as we, we, we said, um, that he once said that if names be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. And if language not, be not in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to success. It uh, it's means something. It, as long as the Chinese elites have not got rid of, the, let's say, the Chinese Communist Party or the, all the legacies, the legit legitimacy of capitalism can only be partially uh, established in China. Because all the people still, they believe, or they, 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 they thought they believed that um, the whole project, the national project in China, is to build socialism. If you say it's something different, it will create some uh, huge chaos. Um, this was, you know, this, this, this um, um, uh, partial uh, establishment of legitimacy of capitalism is okay for 10 years, 20 years, maybe 30 years. But in the long run, it's going to create some problem, huge problem for capitalists. Um, and the Chinese Communist Party um, cannot simply abandon its past, despite possible you know, intentions. Uh, and then Marxism, until this day, remains the core curriculum in all the schools. Um, and you have to learn it. It's, it's mandatory training. Um, and all, this, although it's often in vulgarized versions, it's, you know, it's people, I think that, that the thousands of thousands of scholars have tried to uh, modify Marxism so that it fits the reality, you know, it's like, so that we are doing great. Um, but, uh, but rhetoric has consequences, we know that, and generations of students learn Marxism from school um, and at, at an early age, and, it's Im and we know from, from, from experience, it's practically impossible to fully reconcile Marxism, even a vulgarized version, with the realities of capitalism. It's not easy to do. Um, and the conflict between rhetoric and realities, they, they can and they do radicalize the working people. Uh, China has the largest working class in the world. Um, and the continued social class conflicts, um, they educate the working class politically, economically. Um, in terms of consciousness, class consciousness, um, many people, um, if you talk to people in China in the 1980s, for example, you would find that many of them believe that capitalism might be a way out. That, that to them, capitalism is something the same with, with wealth and leisure. It's something that they saw from the U.S. movies, from the, 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 the you know, the, the the soap operas that they saw on, the, on TV, um, which is, you know, which I think creates a lot of uh, unrealistic expectation for them in the 80s uh, or in the 90s. But the things can change. Once they actually get to see what capitalism looks like, when they actually work in a capitalist factory, when they work in a, under a capitalist boss, they know, well, okay, that's different. Right? There is wealth and, and leisure, but it's only reserved for a very small group of people, right? And, and the, in general, working people will suffer. Once you gain that consciousness, um, you look at capitalism, look at yourself, look at China in a different way I mean, for the Chinese working people. Um, and this was basically how the contemporary Chinese left started to emerge in the 1990s. There was no, virtually no left in, in China in the 80s. It was a different time, but it started to, to emerge after, after the transition. Um, the specter of socialism and communism, and more straightforwardly, the specter of Mao um, is increasingly visible in China. Um, and uh, while the socialist societies in the 20th century, um, uh, as Chairman Mao once said, they tend to create capitalist rotors Elites who think that capitalism gave them more benefits, more wealth than socialism. So they have a tendency, they have the incentive to move to capitalism. Um, but the, the particular China model that we see nowadays, the Chinese socialist society, um, it continuously produces new Marxists. I think it's, a, it's definitely um, um, a unique in, in that way. And, um, and also, we know that Chinese capitalist development is uh, been relying on 
the very close collaboration between the U.S. and China. Uh, for years, the Chinese capitalists have developed a very close working relationship with, with them, right? And they, they, they buy stuff in the New York City. They, a lot of buildings, I think, they, they bought them. Um, but, um, as, but as these countries, these Western countries run into crisis, economic, political crisis, um, it became convenient for their ruling classes uh, become conservative and also increasingly incompetent. Um, and they use China as a good uh, scapegoat. All the problems are from China. Um, and this rupture, I think, in the global order means that uh, uh, capitalism, either in China and abroad, uh, would face a much more uncertain and hostile environment from now on. Uh, it's something that, uh, regardless of what the personal opinion is, but it's something tougher for them, for all of them. I think all of those problems and challenges, internally, externally, uh, leave the, the Chinese elites in um, a difficult position. Um, again, they may have different personal thoughts on this, but they have, in practice, they have three choices. First, um, they, and they can do a new shock therapy, like you know, they, that which they didn't finish starting from the 80s and 90s. A new shock therapy to get rid of the remaining public assets um, that get rid of Marxism from all the curriculum. Uh, they can get rid of the Communist Party. Um, you know, I think many people have thought about this. They, they intended to do this, um, but it's increasingly risky uh, and it's unlikely to be popular. So they have missed the momentum by the eight, end of 1980s or early 1990s, do it. I mean, they, if they, like Russia, they did it. Now, right? But in China, if you didn't do it at that time, now it's impossible even to think about it. Um, second, they can just do business as, as usual. They pretend nothing was happening. Uh, but this would only deepen the contradictions and further destabilize the capitalist order. Um, or third, they can do more regulation. They can do, give more to the working class. They can really move forward to a progressive a left um, direction. Um, but the thing is that any meaningful uh, reform could potentially um, uh, threaten capitalism um, economically and politically. Uh, we have seen some of the reforms uh, uh, in the last few years and the government has at least been given uh, um, more progressive, um, um, at least rhetoric, um, in the last two years. So we, you know, we, we, we have to see how far those reforms can go. But it's in, a, I think it's a, in a good progressive direction. Um, but now of course, uh, I think capitalists over the world face uh, deep contradictions. Uh, but in China, such problems are explicitly political and inherently revolutionary. You know, in here in, in the United States uh, or in many other countries, the problems are you know, between um, this group or that group, you know, this race and that race, you know, um, this gender, that gender. Many of those struggles are, have, uh, are, are meaningful, are useful, are progressive. But in China, the, the problem is whether you want capitalism or socialism. Whether you want revolution or anti-revolution, that's uh, much more explicit. There's no way around it. Um, so I think that th th what is certain is that capitalism has passed its heyday, even in a, let's say, emerging market like China, like what the mainstream media likes to say. Um, and, um, and the struggle around uh, China and also within China um, will be a crucial piece in the ending of capitalism uh, everywhere. So, thank you. Um, thank you so much. So now we're going to have our next speaker who's speaking from Brazil, actually. Elias Khalil Jabor. I hope we can have him pop up on the screen somewhere. Um, Elias Khalil Jabor is an associate professor at the School of Economics at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. He will be presenting a talk titled The New Projectment Economy as a Higher Stage of Development of Chinese Market Socialism.
I just share my screen in one, one, one moment. That, that's okay. Can you hear me? That's okay? Yes? We can hear you. You can go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to all comrades present. Uh, good afternoon to my friend Vijay Prashad, to the comrades of the great Shia Collective. Uh, I will present my, my, uh, my currently research agenda, named the new project in the economy as a higher stage development of Chinese market socialism. Uh, I am a professor of uh, Rio de Janeiro State University, and I am very happy to be here uh, sharing this moment with, with you. Uh, I have been written in the last years that the movement generated from the recent Chinese development process should lead us to a deeper and more sophisticated reflection on what socialism and how it manifests itself in our time. I say this taking into account that socialism is, is still taking its first, first steps as an experience. It is still underdeveloped to, in the sense that we can characterize it based on a set of irregularities and the internal consistence uh, sufficiently uh, consolidated. Socialism, I think, is still something very embryonic economic system. But despite socialism is still operating in an embryonic form, we can already say that China constitutes the most advanced social, social engineering of our time. China has built uh, institutions, uh, institutions capable of generating quick solutions to immediate problems. Its state structure allows for quick action and an ability to intervene in a in really reality never seen in human history. I have also written that historical process that began with the economic reforms of 78 led to the emergence in China of a new class of social uh, of uh, social economic formations, the market socialism. Vietnam and the second experience and Laos the third. In my point of view, China built a market economy, not capitalism, it's very different, uh, and socialism reinvented itself through market institutions, leading the counter to re-encounter its millenary commercial past, generating virtuous economic growth. Since then, the dynamics of this new socio economic formation have been mediated by what I have called waves of institutional uh, innovations that have qualitatively raised the role of the states, while the private sector has increased its scope to action, but increasingly subordinated to a large system by, uh, based by 96 large state-owned business conglomerates and a large state-owned financial system. China is not a capitalist country, just because a lot of things, but one, 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 uh, one example, the private sector in China don't generate, don't generate the cycles of accumulation in China. The private sector in China is uh, uh, deep end of stage to demand to loans and etc. It's ridiculous affirm that China is a capitalist country. The country's transformation, the country's transformations were accompanied by the emergence of a new historical forms of economic planning. Uh, between 78 and 95, China completed its transition from a centrally, a centrally planned, planned uh, 
planning the economy, to a planning that guides its companies to operate in a market environment. Currently, the country is going through the constitution of a higher level apparatus in terms of economic planning, allowing for the emergence of a higher level variation in its social. We need, you, you need to, to, to you, you should to left with this the model of socialism of our mind. The socialism in our mind uh, should be realized in a reality. It's, it's not a, a materialist point of view, in my point of view. Eh? This transition is the result, is result uh, of the emergence of disruptive technological innovations within the large state-owned business conglomerates, not the private sector, not in capitalist sector. These technological innovations are the result of active industrial policies implemented by the Chinese government since the 11 to five year plan, 2006-2010. The result was the emergence of platforms such as 5G, artificial intelligence, and big data. The, condition, the conditions were, were open for the emergence of a new and higher forms of economic planning. In other words, in my point of view, in China, human domination over nature over raise, uh, rising causing the emergence of new economic irregularities. Therefore, pay attention. China dragged forward the frontiers of the human and social science. In my point of view, I have a challenge to me and the others. <laughs> Discover and systema systematizing these new regularities is the greatest theoretical challenge faced Marxists today. A lot of Marxists uh, living to find capitalism in China. Yeah. But in my point of view, we should to, to discover and systematize these new regularities, regularities uh, of the Chinese economic uh, uh, system. This top level variation of Chinese socialism, I call the new project economies, uh, economy. This name is the honor of the Brazilian economist Inácio Rangel, who, when studying the new economic laws that emerged with the Sputnik project in Soviet Union, baptized uh, the, the systematiz systematization of such laws in a so-called project economy. We believe that we can already see at least two. I uh, before I, I I speak about the new regularities. Uh, we believe that we can already see at least two new economic regularities in China, or two uh, new laws of motion. One of them is the possibility is the possibility of overcoming Keynesian uncertainty. I don't have time here to, to expose about that. Uh, if I, if, uh, what, 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 who I want uh, to, to read about that, can call me by mail or WhatsApp. I send the papers uh, that I wrote about that. Uh, the older, more revolution, revolutionary is the planning of creative superior destruction. They, they, these, are, these are two new regularities that we, we discovered, discovered in our research agenda. Currently, China has about 2 million engineers, economists, and all the professionals who work in the preparation and execution of large projects. Inácio Rangel point out that the whole of designers is to guarantee two simultaneous goals. One, technological catching up, and two, restrict, restricting an employment to a circumstance restricted to capitalism. What do you see in China today? In the capitalist world, the so-called superior creative destruction is, is going 
in an anarchic way by private companies, generating a high social cost, including the formation of an immense industrial reserve arm. In China, the same process is currently carried out by 2 million designers. Let's look at the data. About 13 million urban job, jobs are created in China each year. At the same time, the, count, the country must maintain its search for a technology, technological lead. This is not an easy question, equation, but he, it has proved it to be possible and is perhaps the most revolutionary phase of Chinese socialism. The, the planning of, uh, of uh, creative destruction. What does it, uh, that mean? This means that China has faced the contradictions. I remember the contradictions is the engine of process. We don't use the analyze the contradictions uh, to say uh, a lot of things uh, because the contradictions is the engine of project, uh, 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 the engine of process. Uh, China has faced the contradictions generated by its development process in two ways: building hard welfare state. In a, an economy increasingly focused in building large public goods. This requires the emergence of superior, superior forms of planning, economic planning. China is currently in transition from, in our point of view, from market-based planning to a planning increasingly based on large projects, hence the name New Project with Economy uh, that I call of this state of development. Finally, what's the historical form represented by socialism in our time? I don't represent, uh, consider myself, myself a Western Marxist. Sure, I am Brazilian. My father was born in Lebanon. I am Western uh, in born, but uh, in politics, in, in, uh, I am a Marxist Leninist, I'm an anti imperialist, I'm not a Western Marxist. <laughs> I don't take refuge in abstract concepts, nor in utopian notions of socialism, but in socialism as a concept that manifests itself in a real movement, not in my mind, it's a real movement. When I observe the educa 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 education of a project in China, whether it's a, a construction of a little bridge, a railway, or a large quantum computer, what I observe is the transformation of reason into in a, an instrument of government. I think the human reason, uh, the Chinese use the human reason in favor of technological innovation and well-being and employment for the people. To finish this presentation, the new project with economy is the current historical form in, in which socialism presents itself to the world. The socialism is an, as an expression of the transformation of human reason into an instrument of government. Literally, the opposite of irrationality and growing denial of science that has characterized capitalism. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Chris Matohako, who is the second Deputy General Secretary of the South African Communist Party. Um, Chris will be presenting a talk titled Africa and its Progressive Ties with China. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm not sure if we, my video seems not to be coming on. I'm not sure it says... Uh, the host has asked to start for yes, 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 yes. Start my video. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for for the invitation to to be part of this uh, uh, <clears throat> important platform to share notes and ideas, um, uh, but also to you know just appreciate uh, those who spoke uh, before, uh, who <clears throat> at least in our understanding laid the basis for this brief articulation. <clears throat> We will try and keep it as uh, uh, brief as we can, uh, and maybe also uh, more directed, um, uh, because ours is to is to argue that uh, our presentation is a perspective from the ground. Activism on the continent uh, via, among other things, the Africa Left Network Forum, which is a platform for progressives and left forces seeking to build an alternative society to capitalism. Uh, on our continent. Uh, and in fact, in this regard, I'm reminded by the former General Secretary of the South African Communist Party, Moses Kotane's 1934 credo letter, which contained the following, uh, and I quote, that the party is beyond the realm of realities. We are simply theoretical. Our theory is less connected with practice if one investigates the general ideology of our party, our party members, especially whites, if sincere, you will not fail to see that they subordinate South Africa in the interest of Europe. In fact, ideologically, they are not South Africans. They are foreigners who know nothing about and who are less interested in the country in which they are living at present, but are valiant servants of Europe. They are revolutionaries and Bolsheviks, their hobbies are the German situation and the Comintern, Stalin and Trotsky, the errors of various communist parties, close quote. We, we're bringing this up in order to put our presentation into context, uh, that the reality of the African continent, uh, its backwardness culturally and otherwise and etc., cetera, it will not have the luxury of, among other things, debating the very important questions about uh, ideology, positioning, and et cetera. And it is for that reason that uh, uh, when we put together the platform called Africa Left Network Forum, our focus was on building progressives on the African continent, uh, building capacity to be able to mobilize the widest possible progressive forces. Uh, and of course, tapping into those uh, who came before us. Uh, and we want to we want to have that as 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 the basis upon which we are going to present uh, in the main um, facts that are known. But just to amplify those facts, uh, because the narrative that goes out there uh, is that uh, Africa has been subsumed into uh, China's new colonial project and agenda. Uh, of course, what is known is that China and Africa relations spanned a considerable period of time from the 14th and 15th century. But the modern political and economic relations between mainland China uh, and the African continent took off during the era of uh, Mao uh, and the victory of the Communist Party of China uh, in the Chinese Civil War and the establishment of the People's Republic of China. The CPC, which is celebrating its centenary this year, having been founded in the same year, 1921, uh, in July, as the Communist Party of South Africa, has played an important part, an important role uh, in various ways in this trajectory. Uh, in particular, worth noting is that China seeks to uh, reinstate those ties and collaboration uh, in today's context, in today's conjuncture, through the Belt and Road Initiative. Trade between China and Africa has, over the last years, increased by uh, 700 percent during uh, the beginning of the 90s. In fact, the establishment of the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation which is a mechanism through which trade relations and other matters uh, are engaged between China and Africa, has become an important platform and a not to miss calendar date for many players, not only African leaders, scholars, and others interested in the relationship between China and the continent. The declaration adopted at the 2018 FOCAC summit held in Beijing underlined, uh, I quote, towards an even stronger China-Africa community with a shared future, close quote. And that is important. Uh, the, the underlying values that are being articulated here 
uh, are very key uh, and they're very different from uh, from others. <clears throat> the legacy uh, of colonialism and neocolonialism on the continent uh, has had devastating uh, consequences, and these are civil wars, poverty, the burdening debt, and has made it impossible for any African country today to roll back the consequences uh, as we speak of the coronavirus uh, that are causing uh, a a devastation on the, the continent's uh, population. Those unbearable debt continues to inhibit most of Africa's uh, countries to seek a sovereign path of development themselves. Whereas the narrative that China's engagement with Africa uh, has negative consequences for the, consequence, for, for, for the continent, we want to argue is downright, not only ludicrous, but also banal. In fact, all indicators and data available from many sources, not only from China and from progressives on the, on the continent, point in the direction of a critical and important interventions of Chinese economic trade and other relations, which have buttressed efforts of most of the countries on the continent who seek interventions on the continent. And we can also, among other things, draw uh, South Africa's example itself. Uh, as a member of BRICS, South Africa has had the possibility uh, of um, increasing its uh, relations with China, uh, and also because it's a mineral resource rich country uh, with China's uh, appetite for mineral resources, that has kept South Africa afloat uh, and has taken us beyond the, 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 the devastating consequences of the new liberal project that was uh, imposed on South Africa around 1996 uh, by those who said uh, they're creating a miracle of democratization in South Africa uh, and iconizing Nelson Mandela as uh, the servant of peace. They did that for a particular reason. And that does not mean Mandela is not an icon. Uh, in fact, he is a revolutionary icon, but they want to strip him off of the revolutionary uh, clothing and present him uh, in their own interpretation. Chinese engagements, we want to argue, are based on a mutually beneficial relationship with African countries. And the Chinese call it win-win. And in practice, it is win-win. And this does not take away from some of the, the, the errors that have happened uh, in one way or another. In some other instances, uh, these defects have happened as a result of weak African states that are unable to either police and or have policy regimens in place that are able uh, to direct the kinds of uh, interventions that have, that have to be made uh, so that that also uh, assists in realizing the win-win situation. But also the inability of uh, many in, to look at China as a homogeneous and not differentiate uh, for example, from Taiwanese interventions on the continent, uh, in Taiwan uh, has continued to want to make inroads on the continent. It has continued uh, uh, its dollar diplomacy on the continent in order to keep itself afloat uh, and relevant. Um, and all of that is only seen as China, it's only seen uh, as Chinese capital, uh, and it's not differentiated even from Chinese owned or state-owned enterprises in China uh, that are under the discipline of Beijing. Unlike uh, private-owned capital that also comes from Beijing, uh, that is not directly uh, under the discipline of uh, the authorities in Beijing, but has to confirm to conform to certain um, uh, treaties that have been put in place. <clears throat> Importantly, at least for the continent, uh, most of us on the continent that are following China, its developments and its uh, interventions on the continent, is its non-interference policy uh, on the continent. Um, however, as I said earlier on, uh, African countries are not sufficiently taking advantage of this uh, issues. Uh, the non-interference should be providing much more scope uh, to optimize the benefits for uh, African countries in this regard. Uh, and of course, we're not naive to want to believe that uh, uh, those are the helm of most of the African countries are also uh, uh, in a progressive path 
uh, and are seeking these benefits for the majority of the people. Western powers uh, and its allies, uh, we want to argue, are envious of the deepening relations and ties between China and the continent. And the narrative of a pseudo neo-colonial China is manufactured to cultivate hatred against China and undermine the efforts of those seeking to develop uh, a trajectory that is independent of Western powers and its allies. And their interventions through trade and other, uh, through aid, uh, uh, and the increased uh, debt burden have not assisted the continent to extricate itself out of uh, the legacy of colonialism uh, and also its support uh, for military hard men on the continent has actually propelled uh, civil wars and maintained uh, uh, African bureaucrats and, <clears throat> and the emerging bourgeoisie <clears throat> were the beneficiaries of the new independent African state in the main. China's development model is also becoming a model for study for some African leaders in the context of China's heralded efforts of lifting large numbers of people out of poverty, building new cities, and developing important infrastructure. China and Africa in the recent period has worked closely on major initiatives which are important for the continent, among others in industrial promotion, infrastructure connectivity, bridges and other things, trade facilitation, including green development itself, capacity building, healthcare provision, and people to people exchanges and peace and security. China and Africa have steadily advanced uh, within the framework of the Belt and Road Cooperation. Uh, and in the context of the pandemic, uh, African countries came to, to, to appreciate China's uh, intervention in supplying the much needed uh, vaccine. Uh, uh, and what have we seen from uh, the West and its allies? Uh, we have seen vaccine nationalism and hoarding uh, which has which has um, perpetuated uh, uh, the coronavirus on the continent, and uh, whereas China uh, and its development of new vaccines, uh, Sinovac and others have been able to assist us in dealing with the consequences of the pandemic on the continent. <clears throat> Finally, we want to make the point that um, also that uh, China being part of BRICS. Uh, which has established the National Development Bank, which has also become an important uh, uh, intervention mechanism, especially during the period of the pandemic, where it has used its resources to assist many countries on the continent uh, to deal with the consequences of the, uh, of the pandemic itself. Indeed, there are many issues and aspects that can and should be worked on between China and the African continent. But this cannot constitute the tipping point of the relations. Rather, ongoing points should be debated and engaged thoroughly in order to create a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. Um, and all of this constitutes an important element, uh, at least in our opinion, for scrutinizing the relations of China and the African continent. And as we say, uh, Aluta Continua, thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Great. So we actually have a few minutes left for audience Q&A. So um, it, thank you to our wonderful speakers on this panel. And I wanted to get any questions from the audience. Feel free to just raise your hand, and there will be a runner coming to bring you a microphone. Um, so if anyone has any questions, just feel free to raise your hand. And then I'm just going to give it a few seconds to allow people to develop their questions. Um, okay, great, sounds good. Um, how about in the white right there? Yes, I think it's coming. Yeah. Hello, great. Uh, thank you so much for all your wonderful insights. It's really interesting. Um, so I'm actually, I work in investing 
Uh, and one of the things that we're thinking about right now is, you know, like we, we, we invest heavily in China and um, for the past couple months it's been quite volatile in terms of just the regulations. Um, I'm interested in hearing maybe just like everyone, but specifically like what you think about, like if we're talking about the Chinese elite specifically and their role in society and um, the billions of dollars that they have lost at this point, uh, it seems like Jack Ma is not really in the picture anymore, but then there's um, Tencent is, seems to be doing well uh, not, maybe not like stock-wise, but that they have other projects and like space and things like that with the government. What do you see the next, maybe the next 30 years going forward of how Xi Jinping is going to rebalance um, economic stability in this way? Because it seems like they've allowed capitalism to go too far. And now they're raining some money back in to focus on other things. But what does that mean for the the tech giants, the big people that have kind of maybe gone too far, and, and what what sort of evolution do you see going forward with that? And anyone can take this question, um, or to yeah, go ahead. Um, thanks for the for the question. I. I think it's uh, it's a question that we we often ask uh, these days, like how how far this can go. Um, there is a few things that uh, we are pretty certain it will happen, uh, uh, because in, in uh, for the Chinese government, once it puts something in the platform in the program, it will be realized uh, in some way. Um, so last year, when the uh, the Chinese central government published this five year plan. Uh, what it will do in the next five years, it clearly says that um, it aims to increase the share of uh, labor uh, in the national income distribution. And that is a very uh, ambitious uh, um, um, claim because uh, we know that if you increase the share of labor's compensation in national income, it, would, uh, it almost certainly will decrease the rate of profit for capital. So in some way, um, and so it's all built in the program. How it will do it, we, we don't know yet, uh, but uh, it would uh, necessarily involve some sort of a higher level of protection for workers, a better pay, uh, or a better implemented uh, after you know uh, overtime payment, something like that, and which is doing. Uh, so I think w w with that in mind, um, uh, I think that the, the, the government, it's, a, it's a, such a bold uh, plan because for years this labor share in national income has been declining and only starting from 2008, 2010, it started to restoring a little bit. Uh, now the government explicitly for the first, first time is going to increase uh, and this would mean that the government needs to have some power over the capitalist class, like you have to do this, do that. Um, and maybe, that's, I'm guessing, it's trying to choose a few uh, that have gone too far, you know, uh, use you as a uh, signal, like we are serious about this. Um, and despite this, I think there's so many struggles around this thing um, that a lot of things are unclear. For example, uh, when Xi Jinping gave a, a speech in August about common prosperity, uh, if you look at the national mainstream news media, they talk about, oh yes, great, uh, uh, President Xi has been talking about this, it's so great, we're gonna definitely do it, we're gonna do it via uh, so-called a, a third uh, redistribution, uh, which means philanthropy, uh, which is definitely not what Xi Jinping was trying to say when he gave the speech. So. Even as uh, this top one figure in the government give this very important direction, uh, the ma mainstream media, totally under him, would wrongly interpret, I think, purposefully. I think it means how much struggle there is within the party, within the government. Uh, and part of the result was that uh, the, uh, the central government, uh, they ordered all the mainstream media to publish a, a blogger's article across the platform. I mean, that blogger is a Center left writer is not a like a prominent uh, scholar or something, and 
it was a total surprise. But it shows how it shows how much dissatisfaction that part of the central leadership has regarding this 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 whole bureaucracy, you know, all this collaboration, you know, uh, between capitalist class and part of the bureaucracy. So I think there's a lot of struggles that we're going to see. Uh, I'm not sure about the results. <laughs> okay. Great. And I think Elias also wanted to respond. I saw you waving yes. your hand. Okay. Yes. Uh, the first thing is the political question. Uh, uh, looking from Brazil, uh, only a, a, a socialist country or, or a country where uh, are under under uh, rule of Communist Party is is able to do what China China is doing now against the, the the rich people. This is the first point. Right? The second point, I I I use in my research the the concept of wave of institutional uh, in, in innovations. Uh, what 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 it, which it means? In the, during 40 years, the state a sector of economy growth in qualitatively terms. In other words, the capacity of the state the, to, to change of reality to intervene in, in territory is larger, is, is bigger than 40 years ago. But the private sector uh, uh, growth uh, grew in, 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 quantita in quantitative uh, sense uh sense uh now china is is a, is a, in the middle of a new wave of institutional change where uh, no more uh, replace the 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 the, the locus of state in economy now the question is older is rearrange the property schemes of economy to open room to a new cycle of development. This is the, this is my point of view of what what happened in China now. Of course, uh, this is a, a great struggle because the China the, uh, the, there is in China a lot of billionaires and of millionaires and come in the moment of the, these people pay the account of the social uh, costs in China. Right? But uh, I think that uh, the socialism is a, is a process, is a very new, a very young mode of production. That is not a model of socialism. Né? In this sense, uh, China uh, walking in a process of the try and error. In, the, in, the, in this process, in during 40 years, a lot of mistakes, a lot of errors was committed in China and appear a lot of contradiction. One of them is the contradiction between rich and poor. And now China, the Chinese government, uh, show to world uh, a unique capacity to put the rich in their, in their, in their place uh, now. And uh, in, I believe that uh, in China now, uh, occurring a rearrange re of schemes of property uh, as a new wave of institutional cycles that China needs to open room, open room to a new cycle of development, uh, distribution, etc. I, I, I believe that there is a part of history of socialism, né? because we are in a learning process. That is not a model already, not, nothing that, nothing that. We, we are in the learning process of socialism is now China writes a new chapter of socialism uh, in the history of socialism. I think that. Thank you. Yeah, so I just, uh, just want to, I know that other people have questions, but um, thanks for that question. Just one, something I didn't mention in my talk was um, I often think about if it makes sense, and I don't know if what, uh, what Elias would think about this, but in Marxist theory, there's often a debate around uh, real versus formal subsumption, right? That under capitalism, you have a process where previous social relations are either transformed according to the, and, and internalized the logic of capitalism, or if it's a formal process uh, through which, you know, non-capitalist forms are integrated. And I often wonder if in China, if it would make sense to think about a formal subsumption of capital. In, in a capitalist logic under a socialist authority, right? If, if that's something we should also be thinking about, because as we've seen 
things that are troubling in terms of inequality. We've also seen uh, the growth of uh, public infrastructure and public goods and rising wages uh, in China that are, uh, has been uh, nowhere else found in the global south, right? And so the, the strategy was to expose state-owned enterprises to privatize township and village enterprises, but in a way in which the Communist Party of China and the kind of non-capitalist state logic, public welfare logic, uh, was still the authority, right, over uh, exposing these firms to competition, right? And so in, in the way in which the value ends up back with the Communist Party of China, right? So I think that's um, one thing to think about going forward. Is that's, and that's a challenge. It's not an easy process, but there's no choice. It's an unavoidable one um, as well, right? So... Thank you so much to our panel speakers. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for discussion. Um, panel two is now ending um, and we can transition. We actually have a special guest who's coming to speak now, um, but I think we'll ask our speakers. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So now we have a special speaker who's not on the schedule, but who's coming to visit us, who I'm very excited for, Lauda Franco from the Simon Bolivar Institute of Venezuela, who is responsible for education, uh, for exchange and cooperation, will be giving a short talk. Um, in addition, Lianne, who's education director of the People's Forum, will be interpreting for her. Hola a todas y a todos, eh, voy a tener el acompañamiento acá de mi compañera Layan, esperando que no, que pueda hacerlo yo bien para que no esté muy, no tenga mucho trabajo. Eh, bueno, reciban ante todo un saludo amoroso, bolivariano, sororo y chavista, eh, esta tarde estamos muy, muy agradecidas y agradecidos desde el Instituto Simón Bolívar. Sending revolutionary Chavista greetings to everyone here this afternoon from the Institute of Simón Bolívar. We are very grateful to be here. Por tener la oportunidad de participar acá y bueno, agradecida profundamente con el equipo de People Forum, Claudia, Manolo, Layan y todo este maravilloso equipo que acompaña a toda esta juventud por organizar este debate tan importante en este tiempo. Very grateful, profoundly grateful to all the organizers, uh, Claudia, Manolo, all the young people, everyone who's organized this event to be here today and to have us participate. Eh, quiero también eh, que reciban un saludo de parte de todo el equipo directivo del Instituto Simón Bolívar, el compañero Carlos Rom, la compañera Lidice Altuve y la compañera Carmen Navas, que conforman la Junta Directiva del Instituto Simón Bolívar. And also please receive a greeting from all the direction of the Simón Bolívar Institute, Carlos Ron, Carmen Neves y, y Lidice Altuve. Y bueno, también me permito en esta oportunidad eh, traer en nombre del pueblo venezolano, el pueblo revolucionario que resiste hoy, eh, todo está embestida del imperialismo estadounidense. And for now I have the opportunity uh, to bring here the, the comments and the participation of all the uh, Venezuelans in resistance to uh, imperialism from the U.S. Un saludo amoroso para el todo el pueblo estadounidense que sabemos que es nuestro pueblo hermano, porque and compartimos las mismas luchas y compartimos también la misma resistencia contra un enemigo común que es este imperialismo. And a loving uh, greeting and embrace to all of the people of the United States who we know are our brothers and sisters uh, in the struggle against imperialism, against the imperialism of the United States. Es un mensaje que tuvo constantemente nuestro comandante Chávez para con el pueblo venezolano insistir en que por más que recibamos ataques de parte del gobierno 
de los Estados Unidos, el pueblo de los Estados Unidos es otra cosa y es nuestro, son nuestras hermanas y nuestro hermano. Y asimismo lo, es el mensaje que nos da permanentemente nuestro presidente Nicolás Maduro Moros. This is, has, was a consistent message that Chavez would always communicate that even though we're receiving attacks from the U.S. government, uh, with the, we are not against the people of the United States. We are in solidarity and in struggle with the people of the United States. And it's also a message that the current president, Nicolas Maduro, is continuing to send constantly. Bueno, mi nombre es Laura Franco, soy parte del equipo del Instituto Simón Bolívar para la Paz y la Solidaridad entre los Pueblos. So my name is Laura Franco, I'm part of the team of the Simón Bolívar Institute for Peace and Solidarity. Eh, estoy en el área de intercambio y cooperación en el instituto. I am in the uh, area of work of cooperation in the institute. Y bueno, una de las cosas más importantes de, de que nos alegra mucho esta oportunidad de hablarles hoy es precisamente comentarles un poco de qué va el Instituto Simón Bolívar de Venezuela. And one of the things that uh, makes me very happy to have the chance to share with you today is to explain to you what is, uh, what is the Institute doing today in Venezuela. El Instituto Simón Bolívar nació el pasado 6 de septiembre del año 2020, en plena pandemia. The Institute uh, was created, was born uh, last year in 2020, September 6, in the middle of the pandemic. Justo cuando se conmemoraban 205 años de la Carta de Jamaica, un documento histórico escrito por nuestro libertador Simón Bolívar. Uh, this was the 250th anniversary of the letter of, ha of Jamaica, uh, que era escrito, un documento histórico escrito a, a historical Bolívar. document for the Venezuelan struggle. En la Carta de Jamaica, Bolívar decía, alertaba sobre los ataques del imperialismo a nuestra América. This document uh, alerted uh, on the attacks, the imperialist attacks on the American continent. Al mismo tiempo que clamaba por la solidaridad de los pueblos del mundo para defender precisamente este continente y su derecho a ser próspero, soberano, independiente. And called and claimed the solidarity of the peoples of the world. Uh, with the struggle of, for sovereignty and independence of the peoples in America. Bolívar en, en esa carta y siempre en su discurso nos habló de la necesidad de avanzar a un equilibrio del universo. O sea, hace más de 200 años ya se avisoraba cómo este, esta, esta diferencia, esta, esta, estas grandes potencias colonialistas uh, este, trabajaban en detrimento precisamente de los otros pueblos. Bolívar en este in this document called for and uh, looked for the, the balance of the universe uh, against, imperi against imperialism and without imperialism. So even 250 years ago, this was the clear idea that was communicated. Por eso estamos muy orgullosas y orgullosos de llevar el nombre de Simón Bolívar en el instituto y su mensaje de paz, de amor a los pueblos y de promoción de la articulación real de la solidaridad y la hermandad mutua entre los pueblos. For this reason, we are very honored to have the name Simón Bolívar for our institute uh, and to uh, call for the values of solidarity, a love, peace for all the peoples of the world and an articulation of this in the peoples of the world. Entonces, el instituto es una herramienta muy poderosa en este momento histórico que vivimos. The institute is a very powerful tool in this historical moment that we are living in donde cada día entendemos más que solo la unidad de los pueblos And every day we uh, understand better that only the unity of the peoples, conscientes, uh, consciously, eh, puede revertir este orden de desigualdad, can change and divert this order of inequality. Que el imperialismo y los enemigos de nuestros pueblos lo plantean como el único orden posible. Uh, imperialism, which is the enemy of our peoples, has planted itself or created itself as the only possible system of the world. Y bueno, nosotras y nosotros sabemos que no, que otro mundo es posible y en Venezuela sobre todo estamos aferradas y aferrados a la idea de poder construir un mundo solidario, un mundo de verdad, de amor y de solidaridad y de desarrollo de los pueblos. Y ese es el mensaje del Instituto Simón Bolívar y además ha nacido también con la necesidad de hablarle al mundo sobre la verdad de Venezuela. Uh, so we say no, we believe that another world is possible and we are faithful to this idea as the people of Venezuela and this is the message that we carry as Institute Simón Bolívar. Hablarle la verdad sobre el modelo y la, la vía al socialismo. 
que nos hemos propuesto desde Venezuela. And one of our tasks is to speak to the peoples of the world about uh, the, the modes and the tools and the path that we've created as the people of Venezuela. Que es la principal causa de ataque a la revolución bolivariana. And this is the principal reason for the attacks on the Bolivari Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela. Y es el mayor esfuerzo que hacen por bloquear la información a lo que realmente es la verdad de Venezuela y lo que pasa en nuestro país. And the uh, majority of efforts are to block information that's coming from the Venezuelan people on this subject. Entonces nosotros quisiéramos en, en, en un rato podemos compartir en pantalla eh, las redes del Instituto Simón Bolívar, todos nuestros puntos de contacto en, en internet, porque de verdad les invitamos y les invitamos sobre todo a este foro tan lindo de muchas jóvenes, muchos jóvenes, a conectarse con nosotros en esta batalla que nos unifica como pueblos. So for this reason, in a few minutes, we'll put up the slide with all the links uh, and the ways for you to contact and stay in touch with the Institute. And for all the young people and all the people here in this beautiful forum can stay in touch with us and can stay in communication. Bueno, ya entrando en materia sobre la agenda del día de hoy, eh, nosotros, bueno, ustedes muy bien saben, eh, venimos a hacer un aporte desde lo que es la realidad de Venezuela en su relación con China y también un aporte de lo que, cómo lo vemos desde Latinoamérica, ¿no? Las relaciones de, de Latinoamérica con China. So, getting into the material that has to do with the subject of today, we wanted to bring some comments about the uh, reality of the relationship between Venezuela and, Chin and China and also what it means for Latin America. En Venezuela es un debate permanente este, esta relación y esta orientación política que se le da a esa relación con China. This is a permanent debate in Venezuela. Uh, and en um, this relationship between Venezuela and China and what it means. Eh, y bueno, desde el Instituto Simón Bolívar y con otras instituciones amigas, como el Centro de Altos Estudios de Desarrollo de las Economías Emergentes, el CEDES, venezolano también. And also with the development of emerging economies in Venezuela also. Se hacen esfuerzos por, por avanzar en estos debates pero no solamente desde el, desde el punto de vista de los debates academicistas o de los debates más, más que todo que no llegan al, al pueblo como tal. We are making efforts to advance these debates, but not just from a perspective of academia, academia or intellectuals, but also so that it reaches the people at the base. Hacemos un esfuerzo porque este debate llegue a las organizaciones de base, a las organizaciones populares en nuestro país. So making an effort so that this debate reaches the organizations and uh, the popular organizations and the bases, the grassroots. Entonces estos son algunos apuntes de ese debate que quiero compartirles hoy agradeciendo a la compañera Andreina Tarazón Bolívar, que es una lideresa política venezolana, presidenta de este centro de estudios, y a, su, a parte de su equipo de investigación, que es Luis Delgado, un, también un profesor que está trabajando permanentemente en esta línea de estudio de China y de su relación con Latinoamérica y Venezuela. So I want to share a few points from this debate, also with uh, great thanks to Andrea, uh, who, is the, Andreina, who mm -hmm. is the director of the Center of, of Studies, and also the Professor Luis Delgado. Bueno, eh, les decía que siempre es un tema que trae a colación desde la izquierda, mucha polémica, no hay muchos, con, no, es que, no es que sea un tema acabado, este, con consensos plenos, pero sí hay una orientación muy clara en nuestro país, hacia dónde van orientadas estas relaciones y cómo nosotros queremos compartirlo acá en este foro, porque precisamente nos enmarcamos en esta batalla por contrarrestar la guerra fría contra China, el intento de guerra fría contra China. So of course this is a debate that brings many different polemics and it's, there is not one uh, consensus yet, but we all have the same orientation about where this relationship needs to go for the sake of the Venezuelan people. Bueno, a partir de la revolución iniciada en 1949, y más aún luego de la reforma y apertura desarrollada desde 1978, China se ha venido, se ha venido convirtiendo eh, progresivamente en el motor fundamental del crecimiento del sistema mundo capitalista. China has progressively become the main engine of growth in the capitalist world system. Esta nación asiática, la más poblada del planeta, This uh, Asian nation, the most populous on the planet, ha desarrollado en poco tiempo el más espectacular proceso de industrialización y urbanización registrado por país alguno. Developed in a very short period of time, the most spectacular process of industrialization and urbanization ever recorded by any country. 
enormes parques industriales, gigantescas ciudades, una inusitada construcción de autopistas y vías férreas de alta velocidad, acompañado en los últimos años de un intenso desarrollo científico tecnológico de talla global. Uh, huge industrial parks, gigantic cities, an unprecedented construction of highways and high-speed railways, also accompanied in recent years by an intense scientific technological development of global stature. Han convertido al gigante asiático en un, la segunda potencia económica y financiera mundial. Turned this uh, Asian country into the world's second economic and financial. Ahora, ¿cómo impacta esto en Latinoamérica? So ¿Cómo ha impactado impact? esto en Latinoamérica? Primero, para Latinoamérica, eh, nosotros y nosotras hemos visto que esto no se trata de romper relaciones históricas con Estados Unidos. Uh, what is the impact on Latin America? Firstly, it's not a question of breaking historical relationships with the United States. Sino de un aspecto muy importante que es el de diversificar sus relaciones internacionales. Instead, it is more about diversifying international relations para ganar autonomía en el concierto de las naciones, multiplicar sus mercados para la exportación e importación, to gain autonomy in the context of different nations and multiply export and import markets. Buscar nuevas formas de financiamiento externo para la región. La relación estratégica con China es vital hoy. And to seek new uh, sources of external financing, this is a very strategic relationship with China. It's vital para desarrollar su aparato productivo en áreas vitales como hidrocarburos, minería y a su vez en otros sectores industriales. Uh, for developing productive apparatus in vital areas like hydrocarbons and mining as well as under other industrial sectors. También resalta la importancia de fortalecer el desarrollo científico tecnológico con ayuda de la experiencia china y también rusa en esta materia. It also highlights the importance of strengthening scientific and technological development with the help of Chinese and Russian experience in this area. Y lo que nosotras hemos visto es que mientras mientras esto pasa para nosotros de Latinoamérica para China, eh, se trata de profundizar sus relaciones políticas y económicas con América Latina y el Caribe. And for China, it's also about uh, deepening political and economic relations with Latin America and the Caribbean, taking into account that it is a continent with more than 600 million uh -huh. inhabitants. Teniendo en cuenta que es un continente con más de 600 millones de habitantes y cuantiosos recursos naturales. Para China, en términos geopolíticos, la región se trata de un aliado confiable. Uh, for China, in geopolitical terms, the region is a very reliable and ally. Como la posibilidad de garantizar la extensión de la nueva franja y, y ruta de la seda en el hemisferio occidental. Uh, it's also the possibility of guaranteeing the extension of the new Silk Road uh, and the Belt and Road in the Western Hemisphere. Por eso decimos que hoy China es el mayor aliado que tienen los países periféricos. This is why today we say that China is the greatest ally that the peripheral countries have. Para desatarse de la sujeción de los organismos financieros multilater multilaterales tales como el Fondo Monetario Internacional y el Banco Mundial. To free themselves from the subjugation of multilateral financial organizations such as the IMF, the Inter International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. La diferencia sustancial entre la ayuda crediticia y financiera que aporta este país con las prácticas de los organismos financieros occidentales. The substantial difference between the credit and financial aid provided by this country and those practices of Western financial organizations. Es que precisamente. Esta potencia no impone condiciones políticas que socaven la autodeterminación de los pueblos y gobiernos. Is that this power does not impose political conditions and does not undermine the self-determination of peoples and governments. Mientras que el FMI y el Banco Mundial prescriben programas de ajuste estructural que implican privatizaciones, políticas de austeridad y otras obligaciones en, en la planificación presupuestaria de los estados. O sea, cero soberanía, cero autodeterminación. While the IMF and the World Bank prescribe structural adjustment programs that involve privatization, austerity, and other oblig obligations in the budgetary planning of the state, so no, no self-determination. Entre la República Bolivariana de Venezuela y China, a lo largo de las últimas dos décadas, eh, la orientación ha sido del Estado venezolano de llevar esta relación estratégica a lo, al más alto nivel. O sea, es una, es una desde el principio del triunfo de la revolución con el comandante Chávez, la relación con China ha estado en el horizonte como una relación estratégica del más alto nivel. 
Over the last two decades, the Venezuelan state has uh, made efforts to take relations with China to a strategic level, a higher level. Um, one of the triumphs of the revolution, because when it began, it, the relations with China were on the horizon, and they are now coming to a higher level. Hugo Chávez gana la presidencia en 1999, y es a partir del 2001 que comienza esta comisión mixta de alto nivel entre China y Venezuela como mecanismo de, de planificación y de ejecución de la cooperación. And in 2001 set up the China Venezuela High Level Joint Commission as a mechanism for planning and implementing cooperation. Las relaciones chino-venezolanas han sido definidas y consolidadas como una asociación estratégica por el desarrollo conjunto. Uh, China Venezuela relations have been defined as a strategic partnership for joint development. Entre los acuerdos más relevantes que ha suscrito Venezuela con China destaca un memorándum de entendimiento sobre cooperación en el contexto de la franja económica de la ruta de la seda y la ruta marítima de la seda del siglo XXI. And um, one of the most important agreements that Venezuela has signed with China is a memorandum of understanding on cooperation in the context of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st century maritime Silk Road. Por otro lado, el Fondo Mixto Chino-Venezolano, conformado en el año 2007. On the other hand, the China-Venezuela Joint Commission, established, or fund, established in 2007. Ha permitido financiar más de 200 proyectos venezolanos de desarrollo. Financed more than 200 Venezuelan development projects. Entre ellos el despliegue de tecnologías satelitales, cinco líneas de metro o de subway. Uh, so, uh, five, uh, including satellite technology, five metro lines, vías férreas y terrestres, ofertas de estudios académicos de alto nivel para jóvenes profesionales venezolanos, uh, railways, roads, and high-level academic uh, studies for young Venezuelan professionals, orientados al tema económico y al tema del desarrollo técnico y bueno tecnológico, miles de viviendas, programas de desarrollo de viviendas, de infraestructura de viviendas. Uh, so the studies are oriented towards economic and technological issues and also thousands of houses and housing. Que ha permitido, ha sumado a que hoy tengamos más de 3.500.000 viviendas que ha otorgado el, el gobierno bolivariano a las personas más necesitadas del programa de la gran misión Vivienda Venezuela. And which has un helped us. Un de ese país, de nuestro país, con respecto al mundo en un programa tan específico de asignación de viviendas dignas. And now this has allowed for us to have 3,050,000, uh, houses, which is a huge success, um, considering the global context today. Yo soy, yo vivo. <laughs> eh, yo como parte de la juventud técnica de Venezuela soy beneficiaria de ese programa y en el urbanismo donde yo vivo como lo construyeron los chinos, a pesar de que el urbanismo se llama Simón Bolívar, todos nosotros le decimos, vivimos en los chinos. So I have also benefited from this program uh, for youth for technological studies, and I also live in one of es these bellísimo por ahí, que hizo un reportaje de, 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 de esa urbanización. You can, you can, she en, lives in one of these housing developments, <laughs> and instead of calling it Simón Bolívar, we call it Los Chinos, and you can catch an interview that Kay from Breakthrough News uh, mm -hmm. made a report on this. <laughs> Hasta el año 2016, China fue una fuente de capital que aumentaba en importancia en la economía mundial. Until 2016, China was a growing source of capital in the global economy. Que se basaba en dos instrumentos principales. Por un lado, la inversión directa extranjera. It was based in two instruments. On the one hand, a foreign direct investment. Por el otro lado, los préstamos de infraestructura concedidos por los dos grandes bancos de políticas públicas del país el Banco de Desarrollo de China y el Banco de Importación y Exportación de China. On the other hand, infrastructure loans provided by two large public policy banks, the China Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank of China. Los préstamos del Banco de Desarrollo de China, del Banco Asiático de Inversión e Infraestructura, el Exit Bank de China, se, diri se dirigieron hasta hace poco principalmente a la infraestructura y al sector energético. Uh, loans from the China Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the China Exim Bank has recently been directed mainly to infrastructure and the energy sector. Sin embargo, en los últimos años, los préstamos para el desarrollo de China en América Latina y el Caribe 
han sido mayores que los préstamos del Banco Mundial, el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo y el Banco de Desarrollo de América Latina de la CAF. In recent years, China's development lending to Latin America and the Caribbean has been larger than lending from the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and uh, the CAF, uh, Development Bank of Latin America. De los aproximadamente 140 mil millones de dólares que China ha prestado a América Latina desde el año 2005, of approximately 140 billion dollars that China has lent to Latin America. Uh, más del 90% se ha destinado a cuatro países, Venezuela, Brasil, Argentina y Ecuador. More than 90% has gone to four countries, Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina and Ecuador. Más del 80% de las inversiones extranjeras directas de China, ya sea como inversores nuevas, como inversiones nuevas o mediante fusiones y adquisiciones. Uh, more than 80% of China's foreign direct investment either as new investment or through mergers and acquisitions. Se han destinado a Brasil, Perú, Argentina y México. Has gone to Brazil, Peru, Argentina and Mexico. También se han convertido en un destino para la inversión en manufactura en los últimos años. Has also become a destination for manufacturing investment in recent years. Según la Comisión Económica para América Latina y el Caribe, CEPAL, According to the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, China invirtió unos 90 mil millones de dólares en la región entre el año 2005 y el 2016. China invested uh, 90 billion dollars in the region between 2005 and 2016. Al mismo tiempo, en el 2015, las autoridades chinas anunciaron planes de duplicar el volumen de los negocios comerciales con América Latina de 250 mil a 500 mil millones de dólares para el año 2015, 2025, perdón. At, at the same time in 2015, China announced plans to double trade turnover with Latin America from 250 billion to 500 billion by 2025. Este cambio de enfoque ha traído la aparición de nuevos inversores. This uh, shift in focus has brought emergence of new investors. La inversión directa en la región pasó de casi nada en el año 2005 a más de 110 mil millones de dólares en 2018. Uh, the direct investment in the region went from almost nothing in 2005 to more than 110 billion in 2018. El enfoque inicial fue en la industria extractiva, petróleo, gas, cobre, mineral de hierro. The initial otros. focus was on the extractive industry like oil, gas, copper, iron ore. Pero actualmente más de la mitad de los flujos se destinan a los servicios. La búsqueda por parte de los inversionistas chinos de oportunidades en el transporte, las finanzas, la generación y transmisión de electricidad. Uh, but now more than half of the flows are into services. Chinese investors are searching for opportunities in transportation, finance, power generation, transmission. La tecnología de la información y las comunicaciones y los servicios de energía alternativa que atienden a los mercados locales que está creciendo a gran velocidad. Uh, information and communications technology and alternative energy services are growing very rapid, rapidly. El volumen del comercio bilateral entre China y América Latina alcanzó un récord de 307.400 millones de dólares en el año 2018. Uh, so the volume of bilateral trade between China and Latin America reached a record 307.4 billion in 2018 con un aumento del, del 18.9% respecto al año anterior, según los datos recién publicados por la Administración General de Aduanas, AGA, de China. Up, uh, which increased by 18.9% every year, according to data just released by China's General Administration of Customs. Entonces, ¿qué ha pasado en la región? Que los países latinoamericanos aprovechan las oportunidades que brinda la actualización de este mercado de consumo chino, So Latin American countries are taking advantage of these opportunities offered by the continuous upgrading of Chinese consumer market. Diversifican sus exportaciones al país asiático y elevan la calidad y los precios de los, pro de los productos exportados. Diversifying their exports to China and raising the quality and prices of exported products. Sí, ahí hay un punto fundamental en el tema de cómo es esta relación, no es solamente... <laughs> El consumo no, no es solamente el mercado de Latinoamérica de esos 600 millones de personas, sino también cómo 
eh, pueden los productores de Latinoamérica incidir en el mercado o, o tener una relación de intercambio con el mercado chino. This is a fundamental point of this relationship. It's not just about consuming in the Latin American market, but also how can producers in Latin America also have the relation of exporting to China. Ajá. El valor de las exportaciones de China a América Latina fue de 148.790 millones de dólares el año pasado. The value of China's exports to Latin America was 148.79 billion last year. Mientras que el de las importaciones se situó en 158.610 millones. While imports were 158.61 billion. Lo que supuso unos incrementos del, del 13.7 y el 24.1% respectivamente de acuerdo a con la AGA, la Administración General de Aduana. Uh, which is up 13.7% 13 and 24.1% respectively according to the data. Aquí queremos ser muy enfáticos que para el caso de Venezuela y otros países de la región que enfrentan las agresiones imperialistas como el bloqueo y las medidas coercitivas unilaterales que llaman sanciones In the case of Venezuela and other countries in the region facing imperialist aggression such as the blockade and universal coercive measures which are called sanctions. La relación comercial estratégica con China ha sido clave en la lucha por garantizar la soberanía y la autodeterminación. Uh, this relationship with China has been very very key in the struggle to guarantee sovereignty and self-determination. Más allá de la relación comercial, las acciones concretas de solidaridad que han tenido lugar sobre todo en el último tiempo en el contexto de pandemia. And this is more than just uh, the relationship of trade. It's also the concrete actions of solidarity that have taken place in recent times in the context of the pandemic. Porque fue China uno de los primeros países en enviar medicamentos e insumos médicos, vacunas al pueblo de Venezuela. China was one of the first countries to send medicines, supplies and vaccines to the people of Venezuela. Esto ha sido clave para el manejo de la pandemia, el modelo venezolano del manejo de la pandemia que ha sido realmente un proceso admirable de cómo se ha controlado la situación en Venezuela, el número de contagios y el, el número de, de muertes es completamente bajo en comparación de la región y del mundo. This has been very key for how to move and manage the, the, the control of the pandemic, which has honestly been very admirable in Venezuela, the way that they have been able to keep down the number of cases and number of deaths compared to the region and also Siendo the rest un país, un pueblo que tiene que enfrentar la pandemia de la par del bloqueo que no cesa, por el contrario, se ha profundizado en este último año. Especially as this is a country that not only is facing the pandemic, but also the blockade and the sanctions. Bueno, tenemos acá ya a modo ya para ir cerrando como con reflexiones, con algunos mensajes que a nosotros a nosotros nos parece fundamental que como como izquierda, como como sectores progresistas, como sectores de conciencia que, que, bueno, que estamos acá en este debate hoy y que tenemos interés en conocer más a lo que está pasando con China. Eh, en primer lugar, decir que reiniciar una guerra fría en esta circunstancia histórica representa una gran irresponsabilidad, teniendo en consideración que cada día los problemas mundiales exigen soluciones colectivas de alcance planetario. So to close with some important reflections, Restarting a cold war in this historical circumstance is highly irresponsible, considering that global problems require collective solutions of a planetary scope every single day. En este sentido, el planteamiento chino de construir una comunidad de destino compartido para la humanidad. In this sense, the Chinese proposal to build a community of shared destiny for humanity. Es una necesidad de este siglo, del siglo XXI. Is a necessity of the 21st century. Una comunidad planetaria donde impere el respeto a la diversidad cultural y política en un marco de prevalencia de los derechos humanos fundamentales. A planetary community where respect and cultural and political diversity prevails within a, a framework of fundamental human rights. Donde exista una multipolaridad y un diálogo civilizatorio. Where there is multipolarity and a civilizational dialogue donde las relaciones económicas se sustenten en el principio de ganar-ganar y no en la expoliación o el sometimiento and o la explotación. When economic relations are based on a win-win principle and not on plundering or subjugation or exploitation. Es importante reiterar que China hoy por hoy constituye una, una potencia que coadyuva al desarrollo del sur global. It's important to reiterate that China today is a power that contributes to the development of the global south. 
con inversiones que priorizan a la conectividad por medio de las infraestructuras que requieren buena parte de los países de la periferia. With investments that prioritize connectivity through infrastructures that are necessary and required by many of the countries on the periphery. Por eso no es casual la incidencia que está teniendo el proyecto de la franja y la ruta de la seda en los cambios geopolíticos y geoeconómicos contemporáneos. It's no coincidence then that the Belt and Road Project is having an impact on contemporary geopolitical and geoeconomic changes. O oh, el papel que ha jugado en el marco de la pandemia en los procesos de vacunación en Asia, América Latina, el Caribe y África. Or the role that it has played in the context of the pandemic and the vaccination processes in Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean and Africa. Es China quien ha garantizado la mayor ayuda recibida en los países pobres en el marco de la expansión del COVID-19. It is China that has guaranteed the most aid received in poor countries in the context of COVID's expansion. Es importante para la izquierda mundial estudiar de forma desprejuiciada la experiencia china de la reforma y la apertura. It's important that the global left takes an unprejudiced look at the Chinese experience of the reform and the opening. A la luz de los acontecimientos de los últimos 15 años, es, temera, es temerario insistir en que China simplemente en que en China simplemente se reinstaló el capitalismo. In light of the events of the last 15 years, it is foolish to insist that China has simply reinstated capitalism. Es importante por el contrario valorar el papel rector que sigue teniendo la orientación socialista de un partido que se niega a renunciar a las banderas del marxismo, el leninismo y el pensamiento del camarada Mao. We must instead appreciate the continuing guiding role of the socialist orientation of a party which refuses to renounce the banners of Marxism, Leninism and Maoism. Es importante empezar a prestar atención a los avances sustanciales que ha tenido China en la erradicación de la pobreza la construcción de una seguridad social cada vez más robusta y un cambio acelerado de su matriz energética cada vez más orientado a las energías limpias y alternativas. Start paying attention to China's substantial progress in eradicating poverty, building towards an increasingly robust social security and an accelerated shift in its energy matrix towards clean and alternative energies. Veamos a la China de hoy. Es importante que, que, que entendamos que esa China de acumulación salvaje registrada en los 90 prácticamente ha dejado de existir, de, maqui de, maquila de maquila manufacturera cada día se transforma más en una economía industrializada de alto desarrollo. We have to look at China today, this, uh, the China of uh, unstoppable accumulation of the 1990s has virtually ceased to exist. It was from a maquila manufacturing economy to increasingly becoming a highly developed industrialized economy. Desde Venezuela podemos decir con propiedad que deseamos un Estados Unidos más pragmático y desideologizado en sus relaciones internacionales y comerciales, tal como lo hace China, la China contemporánea. From Venezuela, we can say clearly that we wish for a more pragmatic and de-ideologized United States in its international and commercial relations, just as contemporary China is. Estados Unidos ejercería entonces un liderazgo más inclusivo y al menos menos arrogante, sería menos odioso para los múltiples pueblos del planeta. The United States would exercise a much more inclusive leadership and by being much less arrogant and less hateful to multiple peoples of the planet. Es perentorio que todas las fuerzas de izquierda del mundo propicien un diálogo constructivo con el Partido Comunista de China. It is imperative that all the left forces of the world engage in constructive dialogue with the Communist Party of China. Intercambios de experiencia Exchanges of experience. Es una torpeza dejar que el liberalismo económico se abrogue los éxitos de China. It is uh, foolish to let the economic liberalism claim China's successes. Cuando los propios chinos insisten que el éxito consiste en la reactualización del marxismo. When the Chinese themselves insist that success consists in a revival of Marxism. China pone, por ejemplo, en el centro del tapete una tesis central del marxismo en el siglo XIX. China, for example, brings to the forefront a central thesis of 19th century Marxism. El socialismo solo es sostenible en un contexto de alto desarrollo de las fuerzas productivas. Socialism is only sustainable in a context of highly developed productive El socialismo forces. real mostró en el siglo XX lo difícil y traumática que es la construcción socialista en el marco de una sociedad subdesarrollada en términos industriales y tecnológicos. Real socialism showed in the 20th century how difficult and traumatic it is to build socialism in the context of an industrially and technologically underdeveloped society. Toda la reforma y apertura 
ha tenido como fin estratégico la construcción de una robusta base material que permita a un país de más de 1.350 millones de personas. The whole of the reform and opening up has had as a strategic aim the construction of a robust material base to enable a country of over 1,350 million people. Construir una sociedad socialista próspera, sin pobreza, ni privaciones como hambrunas que se registraron hasta los años 60 del siglo pasado. To build a prosperous socialist society free of poverty and deprivation such as the famines that were recorded until the 1960s. Y es importante también celebrar que afortunadamente a partir del liderazgo de Hu Jintao y, de, y posteriormente de Xi Jinping, el gobierno chino viene corrigiendo los pasivos sociales y ambientales acumulados entre 1978 y el 2002. Fortunately, under the leadership of Hu Jintao and later Xi Jinping, the Chinese government has been correcting the social and environmental liabilities accumulated between 1978 and 2002. Desde el Instituto Simón Bolívar tenemos como línea combatir este nuevo intento de guerra fría contra China. The Institute, in, uh, Simón Bolívar Institute's line of action is to combat, combat this new attempt of a cold war. Para lo cual realizamos actividades permanentes de intercambio, de cooperación, for which we carry out permanent exchange activities and cooperation. Debatiendo sobre temas de interés como mutuos y recientemente, bueno, el año 2020 realizamos un seminario que duró varios meses en conjunto con la Universidad Global de China. Um, such a debating topics of interest, such as the sem seminars, and we had a seminar held jointly with the Global University of China. Sobre Venezuela y sus luchas. On Venezuela and its struggles. Miles de jóvenes de la universidad se conectaron a través de, en línea, y escucharon cada semana eh, parte de, por voz de la, del poder popular en Venezuela, de, la, de las sujetas y los sujetos del poder popular en Venezuela, cada una de las luchas que se libran en los territorios por las comunas y la democracia participativa y protagónica, por el poder popular, por el nuevo modelo económico productivo, por el socialismo feminista. So thousands of students connected online uh, every week and could listen to the voice of uh, popular power and hear topics about democr uh, participatory democracy, socialist feminism, and other things. Por eso también aprovechamos el espacio para abrir la, la posibilidad de darle continuidad a este tipo de intercambios y que también el Instituto Simón Bolívar se sume a la proyección de estas, de estas actividades y a establecer contacto entre pueblos, entre nuestros pueblos, para seguir este debate. Este debate es muy importante en este momento. For this reason, we are taking the opportunity uh, to uh, continue solidifying relations between our peoples and to continue the debate. This debate is very important. Un mundo multipolar, diplomacia bolivariana de paz, solidaridad, son principios en los que se basa la revolución bolivariana, en los que se afirma la revolución bolivariana siguiendo el legado de nuestro comandante Hugo Chávez. A multipolar world, peace, diplomacy, solidarity are principles that the Bolivarian revolution affirms and following the legacy of the comandante Hugo Chávez. Seguimos a su legado dándole continuidad y fortaleciendo esta relación estratégica con China. And, uh, uh, confir confirming and building this strategic relationship with China. Chávez fue un constructor de esta relación estratégica entre estos pueblos hermanos. He, uh, Chávez was a builder of the strategic relationship between these two brotherly peoples. Aseguró en muchos de sus discursos que la revolución china es hermana mayor de la revolución bolivariana. He repeated in many of his speeches that the uh, that the Chinese Revolution is the big sister of the Bolivarian Revolution. Fue su obra y accionar el que marcó un antes y un después en estas relaciones y trazó un camino para consolidarlas basadas en el desarrollo compartido. Uh, it was his work and actions that marked a before and after in these relations and traced a path to consolidate them based on shared development. Para resistir y combatir con firmeza las agresiones imperialistas, diciendo con Mao, así, como China se puso de pie, Venezuela se puso de pie y empezó a construir su propio camino. To resist and firmly combat imperialist aggressions and said with Mao, just as China stood up, Venezuela also stood up and began to build its own path. Bueno, me despido con esta frase del comandante Chávez, el futuro del mundo multipolar en paz. I close with this phrase from Comandante Chávez, the future of the multipolar world in peace reside en nosotros. 
resides in us. En la articulación de los pueblos mayoritarios del planeta. In the articulation of the majority peoples of the world. Para defendernos del nuevo colonialismo. To defend ourselves from the new colonialism. Y alcanzar el equilibrio del universo que neutralice al imperialismo y a la arrogancia. And to achieve the balance of the universe that neutralizes imperialism and arrogance. Hugo Chávez Frías. Muchísimas gracias, queridas hermanas, queridos hermanos. Chávez vive, la lucha sigue, venceremos. Chávez vive.